everyone here this morning. Praise the Lord for the Lord's Day. We're going to go on and get started. Now, has the Lord ever given you a song to sing in your heart? And uh, maybe throughout the week, the Lord gives you certain songs, maybe an old hymn or an old chorus or something that you remember. And uh, this morning, I was really just thinking about the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And there's a lot of things in this world, maybe even some things this past week that are just vying for your attention and that might even be a huge distraction with your walk with the Lord. Well, my encouragement is the encouragement from the hymn writer who gave us those words today. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What does he want you to do? Remember his promises. Remember what he has told us in his word. We're here today to worship the Lord to again fix our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, on what He wants us to do from His Word, on how we can please Him, how we can obey Him, how we can live for Him. So I want to encourage all of us today to just be a, a blessing to one another as we desire to learn what God wants us to do in His Word. We do have a few guests here today. It's your very first time for being here. We welcome you to our church family. And if you have any questions about our church, about the ministry here, uh, please don't hesitate to ask me or someone sitting around you. We're going to go on and open up with our theme verses for the year. You can find those in your bulletin. Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 9, right under the welcome section. These are the, the verses that we are focusing on this year. And I do hope and pray that these blessings have, that these verses have been a, a real blessing to you as you have uh, meditated on these verses, as you have um, applied these verses to, to memory. And I know that uh, the God of, of all peace is able to encourage us through his word. Let's say the scripture reference and then these six verses together. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned, and received, and heard, and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I want to just mention a few announcements. First of all, on the table is the um, table for the Access Women's Center, all of the donations that we are giving to them. I mentioned that in our email, but we're going to extend this until the second Sunday of October, October the 10th. And the list is in the bulletin of items that they could use. And again, if you would just rather give them money, that's okay. There are AWC bottles back there. Go in and just take one, take it home, fill it up, and just bring it back by October the 10th. That would be great. And also, there are two handouts on the table back there. James uh, should be coming soon, but he's not here. But he, many years ago, wrote a, a pro-life poem. And he has made that available to us, and so I've made a few copies, and that's back there on the back, and I think that'll be a real blessing uh, to you, so just go on and take one of those. I can always print off more. And then also Wednesday night, again, I appreciate John Nassett uh, bringing the message on Wednesday since I was in North Carolina, and uh, his message uh, is back there in the foyer as well. I wasn't here, but I got to listen to it later, and it was a great blessing, and he had a handout given to everyone who was here on Wednesday. And so we just went on and made that available to everyone here. I really want to encourage our church family uh, to take that handout. It's a wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful message on prayer. And so there are wonderful, um, encouraging reminders about prayer. So that's in the back as well. Let me remind uh, everyone that we do have our adult Bible fellowships tonight and our children's Sunday school. And that would be at 6 o'clock. I do hope that each of you will be able to come back tonight as we uh, have a, a brief time up here together. And about 6.20, we break up and go to our separate classes. There's a men's class. Men, we just started um, a chapter on financial stewardship in our book, The Walk. And so then the ladies are meeting downstairs going through the book of Ephesians. 
So this uh, Tuesday is the next Ladies Bible Study, and that's going to be going over chapter 26. If you have any questions about this Ladies Bible Study, uh, please see my wife, Laura, about that. And remember that on Wednesday, we meet at 7 o'clock for our Bible study and prayer time, and we have the youth programs for all of our children as well. We're currently going through 1 John, and we're in chapter 3. We're starting in chapter 3 this Wednesday, looking at verses 1 and 2. This Saturday, it's hard to believe, it's the first Saturday in October. Men, we meet once a month to have our men's Bible study, and so that's going to be this Saturday at 8.30. And we're looking forward to, to seeing all of our men for that. And if you don't have the book yet, we do have two extra copies. And uh, we would love for you to have that book. It's a wonderful book, encouraging book. And uh, we're going to be going over chapter 11. All right, remember, as you think about it, to pray for those that are away and coming back. I know that Brenda's away. And also um, remember to pray for Tiffany, who will be returning on Tuesday. And we do rejoice. I know everyone... Uh, Saw the email, I'm sure, but we do rejoice in Jameson Lee Stewart's arrival. And so we're thankful for Brody and Mallory. Continue to pray for them. Uh, my family and I got to see uh, little Jameson yesterday at his home, and you know, just a little cutie. So continue to pray for them, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing them again. 291, as we begin singing this, today, this morning. 91, guide me, old love, great Jehovah. Tiffany is doing well. I, we, she calls us, she zooms us um, just about every day and uh, tells us that she goes to a certain place, certain location, and passes out Bibles. And she was by a subway uh, just recently and passed out some Bibles, most, mostly turned down, but um, there was a few that accepted, which, which was very good. Very encouraging. She may have met some Christians that had some problems and prayed with them, and the pastor was there and prayed with them. You know. So continue to pray. Uh, she should be landing in Mitchell in Milwaukee at 9.30 on Tuesday. And uh, if she walks fast enough, maybe she'll make it home by Wednesday night. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I will be picking her up with, with Mom. So we're excited to have her. We'll be excited to have her back. So, yes. So, oh, yes, this guy is doing better. Um, he's, uh, his temperature has gone down. Must have had a bad flu or something like that. So hopefully he'll be back on Wednesday night. So with that in mind, let's sing 291. Got to be all those great Jehovah. Let's stand as we sing. All three stanzas. All three stanzas. Got to be all those great Jehovah.
he guiding you? Are you letting him guide you? Praise the Lord that you're in the household of faith. You're a, a child of God. You can say that he is my shepherd. I want to follow him and I am following him. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and my staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful privilege it is to be your sheep and to be following our great shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. So Father, we, we love you today. We want and long to follow you. We often go astray, so Lord, seek us and help us to follow you. Help us to get back on the right paths. Help us to not be like the prodigal son where we stray. The Lord, help us to stay close in fellowship with you, to abide with you. Our Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to rescue sinners from their sin, to rescue us. We thank you, Lord, for those who are here who have placed their faith and trust not in good works, not in a denomination, not in baptism, but in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus so Lord, we're, thank we're thankful today that it is finished, that the work of salvation has been completed by your Son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we do praise you today for your many blessings to us. Lord, we also want to give praise for Jameson's birth. We ask God that you would continue to grow and develop him properly. We thank you for Brody and Mallory's mom and dad. We ask God that you would be with them now, encourage them, remind them of your many promises, meet all of their needs. Lord, we do pray for Jameson that he would be saved at a young age. Father, we also pray for those who are traveling. We pray for Brenda that you would give her much safety. We also pray that you would give her a wonderful time as she visits her son and daughter-in-law and grandson. And Lord, we also pray for Tiffany as she returns on Tuesday. Lord, that you would continue to give them many opportunities to give the, uh, the Tanakhs to, uh, to Jewish people there in New York City. We pray that you would give them many open doors. Lord, we do thank you for our church and the outreach we have in this community. We pray that we would continue to let our lights shine before others. And Father, we also thank you for other churches as well in our state. We thank you today for Fellowship Baptist in Watertown. We thank you for Pastor Priggy. Lord, we ask that you would... Uh, meet his needs today, remind him of your goodness, remind him of your mercy uh, that will follow him as well. And Father, we also thank you for our missionaries. We thank you for the Chavachenkos in France. We thank you for the Grams ministry in South Africa. We pray today that you would protect them. We ask God that you would help them to, to lean more on you and not their own understanding. Father, we we also pray for our leaders. We pray for our president, President Biden. We pray for Vice President Harris. We ask God that you would allow others uh, there uh, in, in the, uh, the built in, in the Capitol in, in Washington. We ask God that you would work through other believers, give them opportunities to share the good news with those that need to hear it. And Father, we pray that they would hear the word and believe your word. We also pray for our governor, Governor Evers. We again pray, Lord, that you would allow him to hear the good news. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Lord, I pray for him. I pray that he would be drawn to you through your word. Father, we also pray that you would be with our local law enforcement, our police, our firefighters, our EMS, volunteers, and public servants. We pray for them, Lord, that you would 
uh, protect them. We ask that we would be a special blessing to them. Use our church locally here in Fort uh, to, to remind them that they are needed, to remind them that we are praying for them and we are supportive of what they are doing. Lord, we also pray for the persecuted church in various parts of the world. Today, we want to remember the Christians that are in Egypt, the Christians that are in Somalia. Lord, believers here are going through great persecution. We pray, God, that they would be able, by your grace, to love their enemies. We pray, God, that they would continue to have testimonies that are pleasing to you. Lord, we do thank you for our military. We thank you for the work that they are doing. We pray today that you would allow them to hear from a Bible-believing chaplain. We pray that you would use your word in their lives. And we ask today that you would be with Anthony, uh, with Jacob, and with James. We pray that you would encourage them today. We also pray for these three men that other Christians would be able to define them and to be able to encourage them as well. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We look forward to what you're going to teach us from your word. We pray that we'd be a special blessing to one another this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 393 is the next song. We're going to sing two songs in a row. 393 and then 292. Take my life and let it be. I like how, he's, how he starts it. Take my life and then he breaks it down. Take my hands and take my feet and take my voice and take my lips and take my love and take myself. So we'll sing all, all the stanzas of 393. Take my life and let it be.
still in verse 2, right? It says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And we can't just quickly go through grace, mercy, and peace, right? Now, grace and peace are in each of Paul's letters, but it's interesting for someone who has oversight of the church, Timothy has that leadership responsibility. He throws mercy in there. 
for Timothy. It's also in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. It's the only time. In Paul's letters, others, other times it's, it's grace and peace. But for someone who has responsibility in a church in that leadership position, and you're going to need some mercy too, right? And you're going to need that from God and you need to show it to others as well. So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So remember that Paul is writing to Timothy after the first Roman uh, imprisonment there, and this would have been A.D. 62 to approximately A.D. 65. And we have to understand here that Timothy was a young man. He would have been most likely in his mid, possibly even late 30s at this point. And before I move into grace, mercy, and peace, defining those terms, remember that in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, apparently some were perhaps looking down on Timothy because of his youth. What did Paul say to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.12? Let no man despise thy youth. Be an example in love and conversation, charity and spirit and faith and all these different things. And then, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, Paul had to tell Timothy, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So again, Paul is encouraging Timothy, who perhaps needed to be encouraged more than we know, given this great responsibility here in this tremendous, huge, important city of Ephesus. We'll look more into Ephesus in just a few minutes. But first of all, unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith. He's reminding him of God's grace, of God's mercy, and also now of God's peace. And by the way, these terms are not just something for us to think about uh, for our salvation or at the beginning of our salvation, but no, these terms are vital to, for us to remember throughout our lives. Grace, God giving us what we don't deserve. That's the definition I like of grace. I'm sure you've heard of others. But God giving us what we don't deserve. God's undeserved favor. God's undeserved favor favor. I like what one commentator, Hebert, said in the book In Paul's Shadow. He said that Timothy did not have his shortcomings, no one denies. But Paul's esteem for Timothy certainly indicates that Timothy was faithfully striving against them and was overcoming them through the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So whether he was at times timid, by the way, aren't we? Right? God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We are timid as well. Has anyone ever looked down on you because of your youthfulness? Because of maybe lack of experience? They've looked down on you. Maybe even they've judged you a little bit too. Okay? But again, as Hebert said, Timothy was faithfully striving against them and was overcoming them through the grace, so by God's grace, that is in Christ Jesus. Grace. Again, it's not just for salvation. God gives us what we don't deserve, for by grace are you saved through faith. We know that from Ephesians 2.8. But remember what, ha what occurred in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul has this thorn in the flesh, right? And he asks the Lord over and over, Lord, please take this from me. Please take this from me. But it was allowed by God. It was allowed by God. And what did God say in 7 through 9? speaks of this account, my grace, right? My grace is sufficient for you. It is enough. My grace is enough. God giving us what we don't deserve. And perhaps here, Timothy in Ephesus, a difficult place, serving with difficult people, dealing with false doctrine, as we're going to see in a few moments, perhaps he also needed to understand that as God was gracious to him, so he, like us, need to be gracious to others as well. Giving others maybe even what they don't deserve. Following God, imitating Him. Grace, mercy. So grace, God giving us what we don't deserve. And mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. God not giving us what we, don't, what we do deserve. 
Paul was saying to Timothy, don't forget about the grace of God and be gracious to others. Don't just appreciate this for salvation. Absolutely appreciate it for salvation. But remember it for the rest of your life as you're growing in sanctification. God's grace and then God's mercy. This is the one, as I've already mentioned, that is added to Paul's letter to Timothy and also in 2 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 2. One writer said regarding this, this word, he defined it as what frees us from the misery and punishment that sin brings. What frees us from the misery and the punishment that sin brings. God's mercy. God's mercy. Remember God's mercy. I think it's interesting. Look in verse 13 of chapter 1. That, that Paul often thought of, of this mercy. He thanks God for enabling him, counting him faithful in verse 12. And then look in verse 13. Who was before? We know Paul's uh, background. We've already looked at that. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, all right, of Christians, men and women. But I obtained mercy. I can't ever forget the mercy that God showed to me, Timothy. You don't forget that either. Don't forget that mercy. God not giving us what we deserve. There's no, we can't be prideful, right, about our salvation. We can't be prideful about anything that we do as believers. God's mercy. Uh, and also look at verse 16, right? How be it for this cause? I mean, Paul just loved it. He talked about mercy. And again, not in the other letters. It's just grace and peace. But, but in the letters to Timothy, it's grace, mercy, and peace. And then he talks about mercy in this opening chapter, right? Verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtained this mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering patience for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Remember God's mercy shown to you at salvation, absolutely. But remember, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Am I following the good shepherd? His goodness and mercy will follow me how long? All the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Timothy, as you serve, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be difficult people that you're going to have to encourage and you're going to have to say, look, you're wrong. <laughs> False teachers. There's going to be difficult places. You're serving in Ephesus. Remember God's grace. Remember God's mercy. And finally, peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I believe Paul is stressing Christ's deity here, that Christ is God. So the peace, the peace of God, right, that passes or surpasses or goes way beyond all human understanding or comprehension. That is what is going to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace with God brings the peace of God. Having the peace, first of all, with God that comes through Jesus Christ. By recognizing that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, you can't save yourself, so you call on the only one who can save you. You call on the Lord. So peace with God brings the peace of God. This calmness, this uh, serenity, if you will, throughout our Christian lives, not just a salvation. The world is constantly worrying. Jesus spoke about worrying, right, in the Sermon on the Mount. But here from Philippians 4, again, the passage we've already quoted, there are things that we should be thinking on. Uh, then that obviously means there are things that we should not be thinking on, right? Uh, there are things then that will help us to worry a lot if we choose to think on those things. It doesn't take very long to pick a few of those out, right, from the week, right? All right, if I dwell on this thing, if I dwell on this news article, if I dwell on this lie, that's going to cause me to worry. So help me, God, to think on the things that are true. So, Timothy... When the discouragements come, remember God's grace, remember God's mercy, remember God's peace. Before we move on to verse 3, I want us to remember what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Now we often quote, I think, the last part, right? Sometimes I, I have as well. 
Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But here's the, the first part of that verse. We know that part, right? The first part of that verse, Jesus says to his disciples, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. I'm sending you out as are like sheep among wolves. And then be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Again, God's will can include, and often does, difficult places and difficult people. That is exactly what Jesus said, right, in Matthew chapter 10. I'm sending you out as my sheep. Are you following the good shepherd? I'm sending you out as my sheep, but I want you to just understand what's going on in the world. There are wolves that I'm sending you out amongst. In the book, The Insanity of Obedience, Walking with Jesus in Tough Places, the author wrote this. I'll read a, couple, a few sentences. Opening ourselves to the truth of God's word is dangerous. Popular theologies would tell us suffering can be avoided, that there is a way to be both faithful and comfortable at the same time, that there is a way to be both obedient and safe, that persecution is the destiny of believers who live only at certain times or in certain places, that God will reward obedience with success and security. Popular theologies would tell us that even if we are sheep, it is possible to minimize our exposure to a world filled with wolves. God's Word, I'm continuing to quote, God's Word, lived out in present active tense, however, tells us something very different. Jesus would have us understand that His followers, His followers long ago, and His followers today, are in fact sheep. Jesus would have us understand that our world, our world long ago, and our world today, is filled with wolves. And knowing the certain outcome of that encounter between the sheep and the wolves, Jesus would have us understand even in this kind of a world, here's a sentence I want you to latch on to, He fully intends to accomplish His purposes. Jesus will use these sheep to complete His great plans. Remember who ultimately suffered persecution. It was Jesus Christ himself. Persecuted, suffered, so that sinners could be redeemed. So that sinners could be forgiven. But Jesus again will use his sheep to complete his great plan. But that doesn't mean that we will not have difficulty. That does not mean that we will always be in places that are just welcoming to the good news, welcoming to the gospel. No, Timothy would soon find out that God's will often includes difficult places and people as well. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, Paul writes to Timothy, I besought. This is an interesting word. I mean, he's actually pleading or, or even begging. Remember going back to 2 Timothy 1 7 and even 1 Timothy 4 about how Timothy could have been fearful just a, a lot. Could have been very timid at times. And so Paul really is pleading or begging with Timothy. Again, as they were in Ephesus for a little while, Paul would have um, pastored for uh, some three years. In Acts 20, 31, it mentions that. And now he wants to go to Macedonia. And he encourages, no, pleads, begs, a young Timothy, young for that time, right? Anything under 40 was, was young, right, in that time. And he pleads him to abide, remain still at Ephesus. Stay, Timothy. Stay. Stay there. And again, I, I'm not trying to read into the text, but the word literally is to plead or to beg. Did Paul have to do that with Timothy? 
That's what the word means. Timothy is faithful. He was, he, was, he was Paul's own son in the faith. But Timothy, like us, he understood what he was getting into. Like us, he at times was fearful. Timothy just stayed. God's will sometimes includes some difficult places. I wonder, is anyone right now in a difficult place? And the Lord just wants you to stay. And remember His grace. And remember His mercy. And remember His peace. That will never leave you. God is faithful. What difficult place are you in right now? What difficult people are around you? You're trying to get out. You're trying to leave. You're saying, I don't deserve this. You're saying, I didn't sign up for this. But God says, remain. There's a work I want you to do. I'm not finished with you yet. There's something that you must do for the glory of God so that God's will can be accomplished. Timothy, stay. Stay in a difficult place, even like Ephesus. Ephesus was a, in Paul's day, chief port city in Asia Minor, some three miles from the, the Aegean Sea. The city is now, you know, no one lives there. It's abandoned except for some old um, ancient ruins. Streets are excavated, but there's no one there. And this was known, uh, well known, of course, from Acts chapter 19, where there was this shrine, theater, it says in, in our Bibles, temple in Acts 19 and 29 and following, where they shot, remember, for over two hours, great as Diana, that's what the Romans would call Diana, or Artemis, great as Diana of the Ephesians. So it was the great theater site of the riot, right, in Acts chapter 19. It was best known for that magnificent temple of Artemis, or Diana, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And these people, uh, those in Ephesus, prided themselves, they had a lot of pride, and uh, on their coins it actually said these words twice, Neocorus, meaning that they were the guardians of the goddess Artemis, or Diana, and of the Emperor cult. Now Paul's day, of course, as I mentioned, it was the chief port. So there was all types of stuff going in and out. Sailors would walk the streets and just be offered so many uh, opportunities to buy whatever. It was a very large city. Estimates by archaeologists are anywhere from between 200,000, that's the first century, right, in the 60s, 200,000 and 300,000. So it's a huge place. Ephesus granted its people such um, advantages as being self-governed. And they were also, the citizens were also exempt from taxation. Each year, Ephesus was host to the Pan-Aeonian Games, which were very similar to the Olympics of Greece. And these games were held in May, and they were dedicated to Artemis. Obviously, Next to its port, what contributed to the prosperity of Ephesus the most was the shrine. Was this shrine. This ungodly shrine that so many people gathered around and gave sacrifices to. So this shrine was dedicated to Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I read one article that said pilgrims came from all over the world to worship in the temple and to buy images of Artemis and charms reputed to have great powers to heal and to work other miracles. Charms, right? Some of that still goes on today. Little trinkets that perhaps even certain churches might sell and say this will bring you good whatever or, or pray to this shrine, pray to this little uh, thing that you hang in your mirror in your car. And you will be blessed. Idolatry. Idolatry. Later on, in Revelation, right? John, in Revelation 2, indicates that this church, the letter from the Lord, remember, indicates that this church was a loveless church. So here was Timothy. He was to stay at 
Ephesus. Now, I know it's God's will sometimes that he moves people around different ministries, different opportunities, different jobs. Yes, all of that is true as well. But Paul's encouragement under the authority of the Lord was Timothy, this is where God wants you. And I know it's a difficult place. And I know it's a huge place. And there are a lot of wicked people in this city. But I am with you. And you need, Timothy, to remember always grace of God. That my grace is sufficient. Timothy, you need also to remember God's mercy and God's peace. So Timothy, stay at Ephesus. Then it mentioned some of the people, some of the difficult people that Timothy would have had to have deal to deal with. You know, in the little booklet, How to Love Difficult People, I read this. Involving yourself with others usually doesn't make life easier. Instead, it nearly always guarantees that your life will be more difficult. Realizing that all of your needs are truly met in Christ will keep you from expecting too much from others as you care for them. Again, realizing that all of your needs are truly met in Christ. Right, that goes back up to verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace. The introduction in Paul's letter to Timothy. Timothy, I am just giving you this right from the beginning here, right from the get-go. Hold on to this, Timothy. You're going to need this because you are ministering in a difficult place. Is anyone here ministering in a difficult place? Is anyone here ministering in a difficult, hard place where, where there are people that don't appreciate you? They don't love the Lord. What about the people? What about the place you're in? God's will can and often does include difficult places and difficult people. Oftentimes what God wants us to do by His grace is to remain, to abide. So Timothy had to deal with several issues in 1 Timothy. False doctrine, right? Disorder in worship in chapter 2. Um, the need for qualified leaders in chapter 3. And even in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy he had to deal with materialism. And so it says at the end of verse 3 that thou mightest charge some that they teach. So apparently there were some in the, the church here in Ephesus that were even somehow able to teach. So they had some leadership position. Not all, but some. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. In Acts chapter 20, again, the, the, Ephes, uh, the Ephesian elders were told these words by Paul. Acts 20, 29, and 30. After my departing, here it is again, again, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30, I'll skip some of verse 30 of Acts 20, but it says this, to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, 29 and 30. Paul says to Timothy, look, Timothy, you've got to stay. After my departing, grievous wolves are going to come in. And what are they going to do? They're going to come among you, not sparing the flock. They don't care about the sheep. And they, what are they wanting to do? Verse 30 of Acts 20, draw away disciples. Get on my side. Follow them. Follow the bad guys. Follow the false teachers. Follow the false leaders. Timothy, stay. There is a work for you to do. There is a tremendous work that needs to be done. Remain, stay, abide in Ephesus. God's will often includes difficult places and difficult people. He now, as a young man, right? In his 30s, most likely. As a young man, he had to charge. This is a military term. Which means literally to pass commands from one to the other. Passing a command from those higher in leadership down to a subordinate. Right? That's, that's what this word means. It's used often in 1 Timothy. So a subordinate then is to obey the order of a superior. Again, this was all under the, the command, right? Go back to verse 1, the command of God our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul was an apostle, so Timothy was acting on, on the Lord's behalf ultimately. So Timothy, here's what you need to do. Tell them to stop teaching things that are not true. Right? Well, how's that going to go over? Young guy, timid often, right? 
Others would despise him because of his youth, right? How's this going to go over? Timothy, you've got a job to do. You've got a mission to fulfill. Don't ever forget the Lord. Don't ever forget his word. Don't ever forget what God has promised in his word. The same for us, believers today, living not in the first century, but in the 21st century. Remember God's grace. Remember his mercy. Remember his peace will be with you till the end. Sometimes God wants us to do some difficult things with difficult people, right? For Timothy, he was to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't teach a different doctrine than what Paul has taught you, than what you have learned from us, from the Word of God. Obviously, this will be an opposite, this will be a doctrine that is the opposite of the true doctrine. This will be a false doctrine. It might look and smell like the right doctrine, but it is actually opposed to the Bible. It is actually opposed to God's Word. And so there were men who were teaching a doctrine that was different than what the apostles had taught. Paul left him in Timothy for this purpose. Don't run from your purpose, Timothy. Don't run from what I want you to do. God's grace, His mercy, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 11 it says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed, okay, committed to my trust. And what was going on that some were teaching was not a part of this glorious gospel that verse 11 mentions. And so, in verse 4, we don't exactly know everything here of what was being taught, but he was to tell them that, look, you, you need to stop stirring up trouble. That's what's going on. Those were in the church at Ephesus. He was to remain there in Ephesus and say things that might be difficult for us to say at times. Controversy, right? But God wants me to do it. Is there anything right now that God is asking you to say that is based on his word? Maybe based on the glorious gospel, there's something that you need to say. There's something that you need to do. Remain. Uh, oftentimes you just want to leave, just walk away, and maybe the problem will just go away on itself. Often what God wants us to do is to stay. With my help, deal with this issue. Uh, with my words, speak to others about the wrong uh, that they are doing. Charge them that they teach no other doctrine. So look in verse 4. Here's what was going on. It was their stories, right? Their opinions, what they, what they wanted to say about the Bible or, or not about the Bible, right? Giving heed to, to, to fables. It says, neither give heed. So don't pay attention to those that are giving heed, that are listening to the fables and endless genealogies. We're reminded in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Give heed to the things that you know from God's word to be true. Give attention to those things. Not stories, not opinions, not what is this pastor think, he's not in God's word, but it's what he thinks, and he's got a huge following on Insta or Facebook or whatever, so this guy must be right, right? Wrong. What does God's word say? Timothy, please stay. Don't try to get out of this. I know at times you're fearful. We're fearful at times. But Timothy, this is your calling. God's will often includes difficult places and often includes difficult people as well. There was a, a, a mission, an opportunity for Timothy that he, he had to fulfill. There were fables. We get a word myths from this word, right? Myths. Perhaps it had to do with the Gnostics and Gnosticism. Could be. Mythical legends that might have added to, to the Old Testament. Again, legends, stories, things that sound good and might make a lot of money if you print it all up and everything, but it just, frankly, wasn't true. Timothy, tell them to stop. <laughs> tell them to stop. Tell them to get back to God's Word. Maybe some of them even needed to be saved. False teachers, they do need the Lord. 
Look over, if you would, at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4. Uh, start with verse 3, 1 Timothy 6, 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's focusing on his own words, maybe. Focusing on traditions or opinions. Anything but the Bible, right? Anything but what God's Word has to say. Right? I mean, if, if you're going to a church and you're never opening your Bible, or you're never hearing a message from God's Word, you need to read the church. If you're just hearing traditions, if you're just uh, if you're just hearing what is going on in the world and and what is trying to please the world and everybody else is doing it, so we might as well jump on the bandwagon too. And if you're never hearing about what does God want me to do, then you need to leave that church. And it might be difficult, but there are some times when you don't need to stay. Right? You need to leave if God's word is not being taught. So that's what was going on in verse three. Let me return there and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. And then the description of, of those often who, who give other doctrines. He is proud, knowing nothing, uh, but doting about questions and strifes of words. That was going on here, right? Genealogies. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some, right? That, was, that terminology was used by Paul. Some shall depart from the faith. All right, really showing that they were never true believers. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. They obviously did not do what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God and workman. That needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing God's word. So fables, and then Timothy stay. You've got to charge some, all right? Not to give heed to the fables, not to give heed to these endless genealogies. Endless. There were no limits, right, to all of these additions that were being made. Genealogy, perhaps, there were some that said your, um, your genealogy had to go all the way back to Abraham. Perhaps that's what's going on here. Uh, he does speak about the Jewish teachers in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 7. In Titus 1 and verse 14, he talks about not giving heed to Jewish uh, fables. But look at verse 4. The opinions, the false doctrines, the false teachings that give heed to, to, to myths and opinions and more stories and more stories on that and things that, that don't help, things that don't edify the church, the body of Christ. They minister questions. In other words, they simply promote speculations. Speculations. Or, or questionings, right? <clears throat> Instead of, well, verse 11, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So in verse 4, here's what's going on. These, these fables, these endless genealogies, they just simply, uh, they just bring more questions, right? From things that aren't even true. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. That can also be paraphrased, God saving plan by faith. It's another way you could say that last phrase. God's saving plan by faith. Rather than godly edifying, edification, the building up, right? It's not taking place when it's just story time, right? It's not taking place when it's, well, what I think and here's what, what someone else says and no, it's not in the Bible, you won't find it there, but this person knows a lot and he said this, so let's listen to him. It doesn't produce this godly edification. The true way of God. God's saving plan by faith. Obviously, false teachers are preaching another gospel. Paul writes that in Galatians chapter 1. They're teaching another gospel. They're teaching other doctrines that are against God's saving plan to rescue sinners by faith alone in Christ alone. So they're teaching works. They're teaching other things. They're, maybe they're teaching legalism. You've got to do this and look this way and dress this way and, and act this way before Christ can save you. Or you've got to keep yourself saved. They're, they're adding all of these things that God's Word does not say. So 
So Timothy, stay. Give attention to these matters. Give attention to the difficult places and people. There's a hymn in our hymn book entitled, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? So think about what God's Word has said this morning. I'm sending you out, Jesus said, as sheep among wolves. Sheep among wolves. Am I a soldier of the cross? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease? While others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend, a grace to help me on to God? Rhetorical question, no. The last two lines, sure I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. Timothy would have had to say that. I have to say that. You have to say that. We need to say that. Increase my courage, Lord. I'm in a difficult place. I'm surrounded by diff difficult people that don't share my faith in Christ. And it's difficult. It's hard. I admit it. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. Listen to this next line. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported, supported by that word. I'll bear the toil. I need to stay. God's got me here. There's something to do in Ephesus for the Lord, for His glory, for His kingdom. I need to stay. Remain. I must do it. Others are talking about me. Others say I'm too young. I'm afraid at times. I'm fearful. I, I lack courage at times. We all do. So Lord, help me to bear the toil. To bear up under Christ. To remember God's grace is sufficient for me. To remember the mercy of God. And I need to show mercy to others, right? And to remember the peace of God that passes all of understanding. And I'll bear the toil. Will you? I will endure the pain. Will we? Support it. Not in my own strength. I can't do it. We're not, this isn't humanistic uh, thinking here. All right, we don't promote that here at this church. But we do promote God's word. Supported by that word. All of God's word. All of his promises. Everything that God has said. By God's grace, I can serve him in difficult places and by God's grace I can continue I can remain even though there might be difficult people all around me what does God want me to do am I a soldier of the cross let's pray Father we all are tempted at times we all at times perhaps want to leave when you want us to stay of course, there are times when we must go, when the situation calls for that. But Lord, how many of your servants need to just stay and do your will from the heart? Lord, it was not easy for Timothy, serving in a difficult place, serving with difficult people, but he was to be supported by your word, by your grace by your mercy, by your peace. Lord, perhaps we need to be reminded of those three today. Perhaps, Lord, there's someone here and they are listening to false teachers. They are listening to those that might have a huge building, might have a huge following, might even have a huge church. But Lord, they're not teaching and preaching God's word. That is what this world needs to hear. That is what the false teachers needed to hear. Lord, I pray that we would remain faithful to you in giving out the glorious gospel. I pray that we would not side with false teachers, that we would not side with those that are saying things contrary to the Bible. But Lord, that we would stay faithful with you and for you. 
Lord, we have so many blessings to count. The blessings that are ours because of us being in Christ. You have promised to be with us to the end. So Lord, may we be faithful and do what you want us to do and go where you want us to go. Help us, Lord, to be servants of yours who are willing to do everything that you want us to do. Lord, I just pray that you would work in all of our hearts. If there's someone here this morning and they're trusting in good works, they're trusting in their baptism, they're trusting in a denomination to save them, they're trusting that their good works would outweigh their bad works, they're trusting that they're better than their neighbor or better than someone else, Lord, help that one to see that salvation is based on what Jesus has done and how we can be saved, rescued from our sins by, by repenting of our sin, by turning from our sin and trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Lord, that is the way to be saved. It is not by good works, lest any man should boast. And Father, we pray that you would Help those of us who do know you and love you to stay close to you, to abide where you want us to abide, to ultimately abide in Christ. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Three hundred and seventy, three hundred and seventy counter blessings. Maybe two, it may be two hundred and two. If you count. So we'll sing the first verse. Uh, two hundred three hundred and seventy. Counter blessings, let's all stand as we sing the first verse. <laughs>